You're very welcome to this session, which is uh, grandly titled, How to Become an Outstanding Surgeon. I've had more uh, commentary about why I was chosen for this. Uh, as you can imagine, all my colleagues have been wondering why I'm here, but that's a story for another day. We know why you're here. You're here to find out about surgery. Is it worth doing, and how do you get there, isn't it? And is it something that's, that suits you? So I hope we can help you with all that today. So David Healy is my name. I'm a cardiothoracic surgeon in Dublin, Mater Vincent's, and I've gone through all this training program here through the College of Surgeons, so I have some idea. I've suffered it, and I've enjoyed it. So um, hopefully we'll be able to guide you uh, on that. Um, the College of Surgeons, as you know, is a um, massive history uh, set up after the Napoleonic Wars to train surgeons. Hopefully we're not training you guys for war anymore, we're training you for better reasons. But there's a long, long pedigree in history and experience on, on, on this. And as you know, there's a great medical school here as well. Can I just ask, from our point of view, who's here? Um, are we medical students? Are we interns? Are we SHOs or what? So can I have hands up on, on medical students first of all, if you don't mind? Great. And then interns? Great. And any SHOs and beyond? Brilliant. Okay. So we'll try and there's a, there's a different shopping list for each of those groups, which we'll, we'll, try, and, we'll try and address. So today was, uh, has been brought to you, uh, sounds like an advertisement, doesn't it, brought to you by um, the uh, affiliate and members uh, group from the RCSI. Okay, so that's a, a group of people who are there to look after you and try and help you um, get to where you want to be, um, give you the information, get you access to things so that you can, can get there if that's what you want. There is a QRS code floating around there somewhere, I think, and if you can scan that on your phone, that'll tell you all the information you need to know on how to become an affiliate member join that. It wasn't there when I was going through. I definitely know I would have been uh, straight onto that queue. And it just keeps you informed of what's going on and how to get there. Some information and questions. There's an MCQ block you can use that. And it also gives you access to a great journal called The Surgeon, which I'm an editor of chief of, so I have to get that in as well. So today's um, event uh, isn't just about me at all. Uh, there is a panel here. I'm only chairing. And, but we've got a really great panel. Um, from your point of view, I hope. We have Kevin Barry here on the left, who is the director of surgical training. So if you have questions, there's, this is your oracle, here's your answer. So he's gonna to speak to you and he's gonna be available to you for questions as well in an open floor fashion. So you're gonna get information from uh, the top of the group. Sitting beside him is Dara Kavanagh, whose role specifically is chair of the core surgical training two year program. So for those trying to get on it, or those looking for guidance on how to get through it and, and, and come off that well, here is the right person to tell you how to do it. So the panel today is, is really strong. Next to Dara over here, we have Jessica Ryan. Um, Jessica Ryan is one of the top HSTs, higher surgical trainees we have here in general surgery. She's head of the Irish Training Surgical Group. So all the trainees have their own representation. It's not that we're telling you what to do all the time. The trainees have their own grouping and their own representatives to bring their views to the college. And Jessica is the lead this year on that. That's a one year term. But she's gonna tell you exactly what it's like to go through it. And she's gonna tell you uh, a very recent experience, obviously more recent than mine, I'm afraid. Um, and uh, again, available for all questions uh, on, on what's going on. We also have at the end, uh, Kira Tallon, who is from the RCSI, and she's going to help you design uh, your career. Sounds, sounds like a, a, a very modern uh, title. She doesn't have uh, her own website uh, just yet, her Instagram influencer, but she'll actually give you advice that certainly we never had, uh, which is how to start early and, and plan for what you want to do. Now, clearly it helps if you know what you want to do, so that's another day's discussion. But for those who do, uh, Kira will give you great advice on how to map out that plan to get to that surgical career. So that's your panel today. And uh, I think, you know, uh, this has really been put together to a very high level and I hope uh, it's enjoyable for you. From my point of view, I love surgery. I get paid to turn up for work and, and do this every day. And I think, great, God, they're paying me. I'd come if they weren't, but anyway, there you go. So it's like, say, a footballer getting to play a game. It's, it's, just, it's just great. The only problem when we've done this stuff before is people tend to talk forever because uh, they love talking about it. So we'll have to put a breaks on the panels uh, here every so often. So the way it's going to work is um, Kevin Barry, as the Director of Surgical Training, is going to speak next on a few prepared slides. There's going to be what we're going to call a panel discussion of a few obvious questions that we're going to go through 
you're going to get a few minutes on the affiliate uh, membership uh, office and how that can help you. And then we will go to question and answers, and that's in many ways the most interesting bit for me and hopefully for you. So we'll take any questions uh, from anyone from the floor. All right. uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Healy. Uh, Kevin is my name, Kevin Barry. I'm the Director of the National Surgical Training Programmes here at RCSI. I'm delighted to have this opportunity to speak to you today, and particularly in the context of the theme of the Charter Day meetings, which this year is the future of surgery. So it's really important that uh, people like myself and Dara and Jessica and Kira reach out to you and to encourage you to consider a career in surgery because many of you in the room, I hope, uh, will be the future surgeons uh, in our society. And as you probably know, there is an enormous need for surgeons uh, around the world. Uh, so certainly Ireland is no exception. And the need for surgeons and the surgical workforce is very significant. Uh, so. Today, um, I'm going to take you through some various aspects of our core surgical training intake data. So that's why this is entitled the Intake Data Overview. Uh, so what I'd like to do is give you an overview of the core surgical training uh, intake and to give you a high-level view of what took place in 2022. Uh, before I do so, a couple of general comments. Uh, firstly, I would like to say that the, tra the training of a surgeon is a lengthy and an expensive process. It's a very important, therefore, that we pick people who are suited to a surgical career to become our future surgeons. And of course, the purpose of any selection process, and particularly for surgical training, is to identify and to select those trainees who are most likely to become the best consultant surgeons of the future. The process should also, at the same time, identify and select out those who are likely to be unsuccessful or problematic as future surgeons, and to discourage them from pursuing a career pathway in surgery. So each year, the RCSI Surgical Affairs team, uh, who are here today, compile a report to provide a high-level overview of candidates applying and appointed to core surgical training. And then, indeed, all of this information is produced and is published on the RCSI website. So perhaps some of you have already looked at the RCSI website, uh, and certainly uh, that data that I'm going to present today is all available on the RCSI website. So it's readily available to you, so you don't need to remember any of the data that I'm presenting today just to get the general messages across, and it's all available on the RCSI website. And the report is there to help people who might have an interest in surgery and to stimulate your interest in surgery and to give you a basic demographic of those who have applied and particularly for those who are successful and becoming appointed to core surgical training. So what I'm going to do is bring you through this data very carefully so you become so, sort of familiar with the selection criteria and the profiles in particular of successful candidates, which I hope will give you some guidance on how you would become a competitive applicant in this whole process. And effectively, that's the reason why I'm here today. So what I want to do is to talk you through this slide in terms of what it represents. So on the screen here, on the uh, right-hand side of the screen here, you will see what we regard as the overview of the selection criteria for core surgical training. So I want to talk you through this slide and to take the mystery out of this, and I want to talk you through the selection criteria, which are based on six categories. And each category has a defined percentage of the total marks. So if I look at the first category, which is your undergraduate academic record, the undergraduate academic record can account for up to a maximum of 15% of the overall marks that we will allocate to an applicant for core surgical training. So this is scored at the point of your application. So regardless of which medical school you attend, uh, we need to know what your centile score is from your graduating medical school. So this information has to be supplied by you at the point of your application. Uh, if you don't supply this information, your application uh, will be returned to you and you'll be asked to clarify whether you can provide it or not. But if you're not in a position to provide a centile score, um, well, there's a difficulty there. We can allocate an average uh, centile score, but ideally uh, you should have your centile score from your medical school. So that's really important. And that accounts for up to 15% of the overall marks. The second category then is called the surgical aptitude tests. And this comprises a series of psychometric tests which look at various uh, aspects of your psychometric ability, concentrating on things like visuospatial ability, perception and emotional intelligence. 
And again, this category accounts for another 15% of the overall marks. And these tests are carried out online. So you get the opportunity to do these tests online over a particular time frame. You can do them anywhere you like, at home, uh, in college, wherever suits you. But you're, giving, you're given a time window to complete these tests and you do them online. And of course, for categories one and category two, these two categories are scored at the point of your application. So what that means is that 30% of the overall marks will be allocated uh, before you are called to interview. So 30% of the marks for selection for core surgical training are allocated uh, before you actually get into the interview room. Uh, so that's very important to emphasize that the centile score accounts for 15% of the overall marks and the aptitude tests account for another 15%. So on the day of the interview, uh, you're then competing for the remaining 70% of the marks. And that's spread across four categories. And these categories include uh, the following. Uh, number three is the clinical judgment uh, category, which accounts for another 15% of the marks. And that involves uh, talking with you about what we call structured clinical scenarios which could concentrate on questioning over issues to do with the acute abdomen or issues to do with head injury or gastrointestinal bleeding, sepsis, trauma, etc. So we will have a series of structured clinical scenarios that allow us to test your clinical uh, decision making, so to speak. And those clinical scenarios are pitched at a level which would correspond to the knowledge and decision making of a person at internship level so they're pitched in a way that anybody who would have graduated from a medical school who's currently doing an internship or has completed it should have the knowledge base and the decision making skills to compete in that category the next category category number four is interpersonal skills and this also accounts for another 15 percent and in this category the topics uh, that we will ask about are really critical uh, for the future surgeon in terms of behaviour and how you would interact with other healthcare professionals. So, for example, we look at various scenarios that test your knowledge and your ability on communication, on teamwork and leadership, on crisis management and negotiation and conflict resolution. And these are areas that apply to all branches of the medical profession. And they're critical in surgery where we work in highly stressed situations and where there can be sudden changes in direction depending on how a patient's uh, course is going. So the surgeon of the future has to be very skilled in terms of their ability to remain calm and to work with the wider surgical team. Uh, the fifth category then, another 15% of the marks, which is your professional development. And in this, we test your knowledge in regards to curtain surgical issues and whether or not you participated in any type of research projects, either at medical student level, at intern level or senior house officer level. So we will ask you uh, to talk to us about any portfolio of projects or research that you have conducted as part of a team uh, that you might have worked with throughout your training. We will look at attendance at meetings and courses, uh, if you have been involved in any audit projects and indeed if you've been involved in teaching. Uh, we like surgeons to be good communicators and to have good presentation skills and we like you to be good at teaching as well. So we think that these are also fundamentally very important skills. And then the sixth category is the overall suitability for specialty training category which accounts for the largest percentage of the marks, 25% of the overall marks. And this is where we make a decision based on your suitability for training and that's where we look at your knowledge of the specialty, your awareness of uh, the training program, your management of time, and other issues to do with uh, your ability to work as a future surgeon. So that's the biggest category of the marks. So to summarize uh, this uh, busy slide, 30% of the marks are allocated uh, before the actual interview takes place, and the interview itself uh, accounts for up to 70% of the marks. So all of this information is also published on the RCSI website. So I hope I've explained that to you reasonably well. So what happened in 2022? Um, well, in 2022, uh, we got a very healthy 
uh, number of applications. We received uh, 268 applications, and uh, we called 228 of these uh, applicants uh, to interview. So the majority of the people who applied for core surgical training were called uh, to the core surgical training interviews. And the interviews uh, took place in February of 2022. And across uh, four days of interviewing, we selected uh, the uh, most competitive uh, 81 candidates. So 81 candidates were appointed to core surgical training in February of 2022. So the places uh, are offered to candidates in order of merit, in order of merit, that is in order of the total score achieved. And we apply the current allocation guidelines from the health services executive. So what's interesting is to look at the diversity of the pool of successful candidates. So of the 81 uh, candidates uh, selected for core surgical training, they come geographically from 18 countries around the world. Uh, 64 of the successful candidates are EU citizens. And uh, the slide is not correct there, but I believe 17 of the uh, candidates are non-EU citizens. So the point being here is that there's a mixture of people of EU citizenship background and people of non-EU citizenship background. So we allocate the criteria from the HSE. So it's an open playing field as far as we are concerned. We want to pick the best candidates from the pool of applicants and we score people and it's a competitive process and we take the top 80 or 81 candidates uh, using those criteria. Now what's also very interesting as well is that of the 81 people who were appointed to core surgical training, 40% uh, have already passed part A of the membership and surgery examination, and even more interesting, 15% have actually passed both parts A and part B, reflecting an element of preparation and knowledge and awareness of core surgical training from the outset. 30% of the 81 applicants uh, come from graduate entry medicine programs. The mean uh, age of successful applicants is 28 years. In terms of gender balance, 61% of people appointed to core surgical training are male and 39% are female. And of the 81 successful applicants, 71% had one year or more of post-internship experience. So this, I believe, is really important uh, from the point of view of people in the room here. This is a profile of the successful 81 candidates. So it would be interesting to see how you, how you would you know, envisage how you would fit into these uh, criteria yourselves. Now, what's going to happen this year? Again, a very healthy interest, I'm pleased to say, in uh, surgery as a career. We have this year received 263 applications for core surgical training, and excluding those who are, uh, for a variety of reasons, not suitable to be called for interview, we are planning to interview 229 candidates commencing uh, the week of February the 20th, uh, which is only two or three weeks away. Uh, so we will be appointing again a further 80 uh, or maybe 81 uh, candidates to core surgical training this year. So I'd like to stop at this stage and to say thank you very much and I will sit down and I hope that this information uh, will be of uh, value to the uh, students and the interns and the SHOs in the audience today. Thank you very much, uh, Kevin. So that's that's from the horse's mouth, so to speak. So, so what we want is we want we want great surgeons, and we want you to get there. And we're not. This isn't sort of like a, a, a game. We're just giving you shopping list things to do. But at the end of the day, you won't get there unless you pay attention to these details and how you get through the steps to get through there. So you you do need to to pay attention to these micro details. And as you're already seeing there, preparation is huge. Your undergraduate ranking is already ranking into your CST score. Your CST is already rank is going to get you into the HST. So you've got to get thinking about these things early. And this is why this is here. This is why the affiliate membership is there to try and give people um, some bit of an appropriate head start and some sort of support. 
So Dara, you're in charge, Dara Cavill, you're in charge of the uh, CST group and these interviews that are coming up soon. So you've heard what Kevin has said there. So what would your sort of take on, on that be? And how would you use that? How would you guide someone applying for the CST? And what, what, would, what should they take as their key points to focus on? Uh, thanks, David. Um, certainly you can see from the data that Kevin has presented, and it mirrors the data from the last five years back to 2017, there's a diverse spread there of the, the kind of category or, or of individual that's getting in. So I think formally there was probably some misinformation. When you go into a hospital, you'll be told by your registrar you need X or you need Y or you need Z. You shouldn't go in for two years. You should do research first, all these kind of suggestions. You can see from this that some of the other data suggest that 30% come in straight out of intern year. Another 20% come in after one standalone year, which is often spent in Australia. Uh, another 20% come in after one more year. So I think whatever version you are or you do, you can get on with that. You can see there's a gender spread, there's an, an ethnic spread. So, so there's, uh, it's, it's available to all comers, really. And is there, in the, in the, the preparation for it, uh, how long in advance do you think a person needs to be thinking and planning and, and getting themselves organised for it? Yeah, thanks, David. I think you can see from the data, and, and we've done a lot of research studying this, one of the key factors is the MRCS exam. So I think certainly if you are an intern with aspirations for surgery, my advice would be during intern year, as 40% have done, that you would do MRCS Part A. And then you would look, it's all mapped out very carefully on the website. All the data is transparent and you can see the requirements very clearly. Uh, research is important, but my message to you would be that MRCS is very important and all those criteria are important. And research is relevant along the way, but not the be all and end all at the start. Yeah, that does, there's a lot in that. We might, we might develop that a bit more. And Kevin, we, we need to talk about the MRCS B, if you don't mind, between two. So you need to remember to come back to that. Jessica, Ryan, you're... you're in the middle of all this, and uh, you've been through this, uh, you, you might tell people what you remember of it, and what would, what would you guide people through, first of all, the, um, about your undergraduate medical career? Did you know you wanted to be a surgeon th at that stage? And did, was there anything that you did you, that, in your undergraduate medical career that you thought helped, just to start with? Uh, thanks, uh, Prof. Um, yeah, so I, <coughs> I would echo what some of what's already been said in that, when you decide you want to do surgery, that's when your application process sort of starts, and that's when you can be making small changes and efforts to make the process easier for yourself in the long run so that you're not getting to maybe six months before the interview and all of a sudden trying to do every course available to you and write six research papers and find a mentor in that time. So I would try to find a mentor early, if not now. Um, surgical trainees love meeting the new generation um, applying for training I think if you approach somebody who you admire in the field that you're interested in all you have to do is tell them that you want to do surgery and they'll probably get very excited so um, now if they're not don't worry about it the worst somebody can say, the worst thing someone can say is no but that person will give you research projects audits they'll your relationship with them will develop throughout your entire career and they'll be a huge help to you so that's the the biggest bit of advice I can give you at the earliest stage is to try to find somebody who's maybe a little bit more accomplished than you are along their training program. Um, and then other than that, it's definitely to try to get the MRCS done, you know, as, as early as possible. And if you're already on the training scheme, you know, not to stress about it, just to right. <laughs> so get your, there So your intern year, the, the, your main goal was the MRCS, was it? Did you have it before you did CST? So right. I did, I had part A before I applied for CST. I did a standalone year in general surgery in Beaumont Hospital um, where I met, you know, one of my biggest mentors throughout this process and I did my part A in that year. Um, that's not to say you need to take time out beforehand, but it's definitely worth trying to get that big stress out of the way now if you can. So yeah, just to touch that, so you did an intern year and then you did a standalone SHO year before you even thought of applying. So we're not advocating exactly that you have to do it, but it is something I see people do. And so you, you use that for the MRCS and you did a few projects, I'm guessing, or yeah. research or what else? Yes. You got a, was your logbook good at the end of that standalone year? I had a great logbook because I started doing minor ops and I became, you know, I increased my independence with my minor ops during that year so that when I got into, got onto CST, I was able to hit the ground running in terms of being able to 
suture and do the basics. But I did a couple of research projects, very doable within the year. So I wouldn't advise signing up for anything you know you can't finish. Um, and, oh, uh, I couldn't agree with yeah. that one more. <laughs> oh my God. There's nothing worse than a trainee who doesn't finish the project, but go on. Uh, <laughs> Um, I did ATLS, Advanced Trauma Life Support. Um, I went to a couple of meetings, I networked, I got to know people, and, um, and, I, and most importantly, I got Part A done as well. Very good. And then in your CST period, any key things that you felt were, that you really focused on from the next step to get for your HST application? Yeah, so... Oh, sorry, just one Did you jump from the CST straight on or did you do a gap year then? Again? I went straight on yeah, to the okay, general surgery through. HST. So, yeah, okay. so I have lots of advice for CSTs, so just stop me at any point okay. if I'm going over time. Go. <laughs> <laughs> so I would advise sitting down with your SPR as soon as possible and go through the marking scheme for HST. Um, keep a diary of all of the points available to you before you get to your HST interview. So you should know where you stand in every quarter of every year. And when you get your operative surgical skills marks and your human factors marks and even your MRCS part B score, put it into the diary so you know where you stand. And you have backstops as well, right? So you know when you're falling behind. The logbook will give you an, a real time um, say average of your class, so you should be aiming to surpass that as much as possible and maxim maximizing your logbook points every six months. Um, and they're really the most important things. Be you know know that marking scheme like the back of your hand, and just hit your milestones um, as you're as you're going through. And really, if you are falling behind, you should know about it straight away. Very good. We didn't have to stop it. <laughs> the, uh, the, I'd say there's lots more we, 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 we'll get from you then, but I get, I get one of the things that does come up is there's kind of foundation core things that you need to focus on. You cannot get anywhere without them, and that's the MRCS, and that's the logbook. And what we mean by, by to those who aren't involved, as your cases, how do you measure a surgeon? How do you know a surgeon can do the job? Um, so it, it, to try and make it less subjective, someone says, oh, he's a good guy, he's a bad girl, whatever, th that kind of stuff. It, you, you, the logbook, which records your activity, is key and very high scoring metric, which we might touch on later on. So they're the foundation. And yes, we love people doing projects. I love people doing projects. And we love people doing, you're doing an MD, aren't you? Yeah. yeah so we love people doing that. But they're, ex, they're above the foundation. You cannot get that high unless you've got the foundation done, which is your MRCS. Your and and your logbook. Uh, we we might come back to the postgraduate degree in a bit if you don't mind. Kira Talon, I'd I'd like to talk to you. Um, so you're guiding um, people at that early phase, and and can you tell us? I, I think in doing that, have you had scenarios where like you've had tears and you're trying to pick up the pieces? Like so, how does how do you avoid someone finding themselves in that position that they're you're trying to help them to pick up the pieces? What would you say to them early on? Sure. Thanks, Prof. Um, what we'd say is this is a very competitive process and we've seen that and, and Prof Healy mentioned that as well. Um, so understanding what you're going into I think is really important and I know that might sound like a really basic statement but really understanding well what are those figures, what are the stats, how, how do I stack up and, and be realistic. That's not to talk yourself out of it in any way. Let's be ambitious and back ourselves here but essentially it's to be very clear about what's required. How early do I need to start? Um, so I think we discussed here, I, I wouldn't start here. So start as early as you can. Wherever there's that spark of interest, whether it's on your rotations, whether it's somebody that you've met, member, uh, on sorry, um, it could be a tutor or a professor that really inspires you. It's to harness that nugget, be very self-aware, be very aware of what's happening that you feel, I could get really excited about this. And then go with that. Surround yourself with people, whether that's a mentor, whether that's a study group, join the, the surgical societies, um, but inspire yourself and surround yourself by people who will motivate you. Um, after that, I would say, make a plan. So do you understand the timelines? Do you know how long you've got? Um, so if we're talking research, and I know Jessica mentioned it as well, how early do I need to start so that I enjoy the research? Um, and hopefully it's something that you think you'd follow through into your career, but it doesn't necessarily need to be like that. It could be something that just gives you that experience and exposure to carrying out a piece of research. Do I understand the methodology? So that's a great skill to have and one of the things that you'd be bringing into your training. Um, say yes to everything, put your hand up, whether that's teaching, tutoring, um, supporting, supporting each other. Really start early. 
and then be mindful of having a plan B. And that's something that myself and my colleagues are always suggesting to students. We all have what's called, what can be described as a squiggly career. It doesn't necessarily have to follow each other's same pathway or the same, it's not a linear career in any way. And we know that now, we know we can step off and step back on again when something else inspires us. So be comfortable with that. This is your career, not anybody else's. So your peers might all be following one specific pathway. It's okay to follow your own pathway. We're here uh, to support you in your decisions. Um, so it's backing yourself, having the confidence of your decisions, discussing it. Again, one of the things we discuss is an accountability partner. Who's there to hold you to those deadlines and timelines? They don't necessarily need to understand what you're doing or understand the language. They know that there's a timeline for Friday the 3rd of February. Have you done what you said you're going to do? And that can be really helpful. So we don't get caught out on missing an application date, missing an application sub submission. So I'd suggest that surround yourself by good, positive, constructive people who are going to help you in your career. And those people can evolve with your career also. They don't necessarily need to be the same people. They don't necessarily need to be the same mentor. That can all grow and develop with you. Um, but I would just say, put your hand up if you need anything. Um, go to your, talk to your careers team, uh, discuss your options. We're always here to support you. But, but it's starting that process of engagement. Start the conversation and then the supports can be there for you. And then I would say, in terms of the affiliate membership, use all of these fantastic supports. If you think you have an aspiration to be a... Uh, to get, maybe it's vascular or cardiology, well then begin to develop a curiosity for that aspect as well. So you're, you're embedding yourself in the language of the future career, which I think is really, really helpful. Very good. Can you think of any, um, a short answer on this one, any uh, quick rescues? When you had someone in trouble get you, you, you dug them out of, can you think of any specific ones? Um, I think it's, again, plan B. Well, what can we do on a gap year? And that's one of the, the workshops we run here is there are always options, but you need to flag that. Um, all is not lost. If there's an exam missed, we can, we can reapply. And I think that's once you understand that there's always a plan B, um, we can do that. Maybe that's an SHO year. Maybe that's a gap year to become a clinical tutor, um, do a master's, do some research. Clinical tutors were always great jobs. Yeah. Uh, Lecture in anatomy in the College of Surgeons for a year was always a fabulous job. A uh, traditional one for surgeons to do, uh, doing a postgraduate degree, absolutely, yeah. Kevin, in, in your slide you had, um, you said that 40% of the people I think have got their MRCSA coming on to CST. You know, I just wanna we'll chat about this now again. So the affiliate membership is something that you can look up on and find and you pay the subscription fee. And we're encouraging people to do part A, it sounds like, that the competitive ones have done part A. But can I just okay, one point on the part B so that the people are aware of. The part B score goes into the metrics for the higher surgical training maths. So it's important to have a good part B score. Isn't that right, Kevin? And what would you say about timing on that one? Yeah, I think, it's, I think you know, again, just to sort of go back to the exams, uh, Exams are important. Uh, this is a competitive selection process. The selection criteria have been very carefully designed uh, by various colleagues, including Professor Trainer, who's here in the audience today. And a lot of research and work has gone in to validate these selection criteria. And, and indeed, the selection criteria that we use in this college have been looked at by other colleges of surgeons throughout Europe. Uh, so uh, we're, we're happy that we're using appropriate selection criteria. Uh, now, getting on to the uh, aspect about the exams, I think uh, the fact that 40% of successful candidates have passed Part A is a reflection of the awareness amongst people like yourselves and others around uh, the need to get these exams. Uh, and again, because RCSI has published all of this information on the RCSI website, medical students and interns in particular are aware of these, uh, if you like, uh, website materials, and these have been very useful uh, in circumstances, for example, where I've spoken with various student surgical societies. So over the last couple of years, I've had the pleasure to speak with the RCSI Student Surgical Society and also with the uh, 
UCD uh, Medical Student Society. So what I find is that people who are interested in a career in surgery have already done a certain amount of research, they've spoken to people, and they've become aware of the building blocks or the selection criteria, and they already have an awareness of the exams. Last year, for example, we produced a YouTube production, uh, plugging our YouTube production, So You Want to Be a Surgeon. So You Want to Be a Surgeon, which was a 90-minute uh, production here from the RCSI. And we interviewed various people, medical students, for example, surgical trainees and consultants. And what came out of all of the mix, uh, from my point of view, is that, number one, uh, people who want to do surgery tend to have their minds made up at the medical student stage. And they tend to know that they're very certain at a medical student stage that they want to do surgery. And not only that, they've already more or less decided which branch of surgery they want to uh, train in. Uh, for their careers. And I think allied to that determination, if you like, and enthusiasm is an awareness around selection criteria and the examinations. So I think it reflects competition. I think it reflects the awareness that's out there, the RCSI website, uh, our interaction with the student uh, societies. Also, I should mention the RCSI and all the other uh, medical schools participate in a surgical skills competition. So there's a certain amount of interaction between the universities in terms of looking at surgical skills and surgical ability at the medical student level. And I think people talk to each other, and aspiring surgeons talk to surgical trainees like Jessica, who's particularly articulate in this area, and her colleagues in the Irish Surgical Training Group. So you have lots of different uh, resources available to you. And then 15% of people have passed the Part A and Part B. And again, I think this reflects awareness and preparation on the part of the candidates going forward for surgery. Core surgical training, there's a lot in it over a two-year period. There's a lot to learn. There's a lot of classes, uh, simulation classes, human factors classes, clinical training. Uh, the examinations, per se, are really crucial. And if you can get part A of the examination passed as soon as you can, I think that takes a certain amount of pressure off you and it gives you more time to prepare for part B. And what we, what we find then is that when people go into the second year of core surgical training, it's really critical, coming back to David's point, that they have passed part B to have their A and part B passed, tick that box, because you can't progress to higher surgical training at the end of core surgical training unless you've passed both parts. So for people who are planning ahead and who are thinking ahead and sort of, you know, saying, what will I be doing in one year's time, two years' time, three years' time, getting your exams, I think, is a smart uh, philosophy and getting them out of the way uh, early on, if you can, is, is a good idea because then you can concentrate on the training and the quality of the training in the uh, core surgical training program. Examinations are a source of stress uh, for everybody. Uh, so, you know, if you can get part A out of the way during something like a, stand, a standout year that Jessica did, all the better. Um, so I think, you know, without sort of sounding like we're obsessed about the exams, it's just practical advice. It's practical advice uh, that we're giving people here today. And I suppose Dara and myself in particular, you know, we know the profile of people who are successful in terms of going from core surgical training to higher surgical training. And unfortunately, there are some people, for whatever reason, who do not pass part B of the examination during core surgical training. And then, unfortunately, they cannot progress to higher surgical training. So, you know, what I'm saying is that if you're going to become a core surgical trainee, you should plan to become a higher surgical trainee at the end of that two year period. Uh, so, the exams are hugely important. So that's, that's what, what I would hear there is, is to understand that surgeons are prepared. You don't yeah. turn up for an operation and just go, oh, who am I operating today? You've thought about it beforehand, you've planned beforehand. So your career isn't just something you decide yeah. the day before the interview, you've worked it through. The exams, um, I would just, one little tiny point I think I, I would bring in, it's, yeah. um, so for your, so when you do your two years core surgical training, you're trying to get on to your specialty higher surgical training six years after that, and that jump off, just to really emphasize to people, you can't get the interview, as Kevin has said, unless you've passed your part A and B in the MRCS. But the score in the part B is taken into account. So I just want, for those particularly at the, at, up at the other end, to just be mindful that, yes, we want you to pass it all, obviously. And uh, there is an advantage to passing the part A quick, because as Kevin said, then when you're on your 
CST years, you're focusing on the other half of your score in metrics, the logbook. So instead of taking time off studying to pass an MRC exam, you're in the operating room fattening up your logbook. And there's a huge advantage to that. But rushing the part B can be a mistake. So I think you want to turn up for the part B well prepared, not just to pass it, because if, if you want to be a pediatric neurosurgeon and there are 20 people looking for it and you want to be the front of the queue, you need a very good score in your part B. So you just be mindful that I, were, I would encourage people absolutely to take on the part A as absolutely as par early as possible. But I don't know, Jessica, would you, would you agree with the part B thing? That When did you do your part B? Um, I actually can't remember. I can't remember. Um, but it was, I, you anyway. I think it might have been an ST1, but, um, and, and I know this all sounds, might, might sound a bit scary to some of you, but it's actually a great exam to study for, and maybe you think I'm mad, but like if you look at these things in a positive light, it'll make it so much easier for you. Um, so if there's some ST1 sitting in here, like worrying about your party, just <laughs> don't stress, you'll get there. Um, but you need to put in the time, like I would say, I spent about three months studying for part A, and then the part B, um, which is a lot more practical, obviously, yeah. I think that's, so that would be the key thing for me in the part B. The part B is, I would say it's a very manageable exam, yeah. if you're a working SHO. Uh, if you're very early, you're an intern, and you absolutely power through very quickly, and try to do the part B super early, before you've got much clinical experience, it can be a bit wobbly. Whereas the, if you're working SHO, you will get the part B okay, but you need to try and do a good score. Uh, Dara, just to tell us, like, uh, they come into the core, the core specialty training as a surgeon. So how are they supposed to pick a specialty? Or how, are they, how, the, how do you arrive at picking your specialty for the training? Thanks, David. Yeah, I think that's, that's, a, that's a big challenge, big interesting question. I suppose part of the training program, working with Professor Trainer over the last decade, we've tried to have evidence to support everything and through research and analysis and I suppose what we have found is all of our selection criteria do predict becoming a surgeon but not a specialty so so we really don't know what factors predict a specific specialty uh, what strikes me in general about uh, the younger generation now is I saw a patient recently on call transition year and she was able to tell me that she wanted to do veterinary, but she also knew the subspecialty within veterinary she wanted to do, which is very impressive. Um, we see students coming through in Tala from Trinity in third year, and it's not just surgery they want to do, it's plastic surgery or a subset of surgery, which again is very impressive. So I think it really boils down to your exposure and your mentorship. When I was a medical student, I worked with a team of orthopedic surgeons in St. Vincent's. I was very taken by the camaraderie I'd been in boarding school and I went and had a fried breakfast every morning with my orthopaedic colleagues and it was very impressive, a lot of camaraderie and I thought maybe I wanted to do orthopaedics, a um, lot of other advantages to doing orthopaedics. When I became an intern I was fortunate enough to work with my uh, mentor for the last 22 years, Professor Trainer, and certainly that guided me into general surgery um, and, that, and that was my personal experience. Um, so I think one of the messages I learned early in my career was that um, don't necessarily sign up to the personalities in the specialty because maybe I was very taken by the, ca the camaraderie in orthopaedics, but maybe not the technical side of it. Whereas in general surgery, it's for me, uh, orthopaedics perhaps wouldn't. So you can certainly have mentors, they can be very influential, but just be sure that you actually like the specialty. Another bit of advice I got along the way as regarding when I got further in my career to decide the subset of general surgery was um, that each subspecialty of general surgery has its own, I suppose, group of heart sink patients. And I was unclear whether I do colorectal or vascular. And I suppose you want to think over the next 20, 30 years, the kind of cohort of patients you're going to be looking after. And for me, the, the big thing in general surgery is the abdominal pains, which is something that's interesting for me and challenging. Whereas maybe in vascular, the the group of patients that are challenging are perhaps the, the, the leg ulcer patients or something like that, and they're different in each subspecialty. So just just sit and watch your mentor in the outpatients when they're seeing 30-odd patients and see what kind of stuff they're doing every day and is that for you. So make sure it's just not the personality. Make sure it's all aspects of the job because it's a, it's a big career. And the final thing I will say as a, as a, as a kind of a encouragement for general surgery is when I talk to some of my CSTs in Talad and they see me there at 10 o'clock at night, they, say, they shake their head and say, why on earth would you do general surgery? 
you're always here late and you're always uh, working late. I think that's a personal choice uh, and I'm not there every day. I think on-call rotas in general surgery can be quite uh, onerous, but we rarely, if ever, operate in the middle of the night. We, we might, I'd say in a, in a year, I'm in four times after midnight and there's, there's good data to support us not operating in the middle of the night. So um, pick the specialty, stick with it, don't be taken in so much by the personalities that are doing it and meander through all the various aspects of it and make sure you pick the right specialty. Well, that's great advice, Sarah. And I, th I think um, what you commented on about the work ethic, like um, whatever you do in life, uh, if you're doing law or accountancy, whatever the hell, it, you're going to be working hard if you want to be good at it. So uh, sort of saying surgery is hard, great it is a bit, but so is anything that's kind of worthwhile by and large. Uh, mostly you do it not but you know not to suffer it but because you kind of enjoy it and it doesn't seem that hard when you're doing it being honest with you Kira you've helped us with some uh, or help candidates put applications together and things like that so what would they, the shopping list things that you would you would say that they should do or any mistakes you've seen people make sure um, I think like I said earlier it's starting early so understand what the application process is what are those where are the areas that you gain most points in and again, we're starting with your, your ranking. So um, for, for current medical students, I would say focus on your ranking at the moment. That's going to be really important because that sees you through right through. Um, after that, then it's set up a file. And I know I spoke to our own Surgical Society president, Connor Sheehan, about this. And you know, set up a file on your desktop. Everything that you need for this application should be on that desktop accessible immediately. So the most current up-to-date CV that you can have have someone review that for you. Always a fresh pair of eyes. Um, any awards, certificates that you've gained, um, any invitations to speak, any invitations to poster presentations, that's all documented evidence that you have developed all of those elements that go towards your application. So we have seen students who panic, perhaps they're missing a search, they're missing something that's really vital that's going to help them to stand out. So try not to be that, that applicant. Capture it all, spend a weekend if you have to, email, registry, email where, wherever you need to, to email to contact them, to have all of that documentation ready to go. Um, applying is not the night before the, the deadline. It's weeks in advance. It's being comfortable with what you're being asked to uh, support and to apply. It's being comfortable with the language that they're using, that, that you're mirroring that as well. Um, capture everything. Um, have somebody else review it for you. Um, basic things like grammar and spelling. There's no reason why that should be the case. But also mindful of, of your, your referees um, that you're using. Have their titles changed? Have their roles changed in the time that perhaps you knew them from? So be, very, be mindful of that small detail. Um, and have the confidence that because you're not rushing it, it's going to be a good, strong application. And sorry, one thing I, I, I'm conscious of as well, if your bias is maybe towards research and it's not for conducting audits or poster presentations, again, be mindful of that and be conscious that you have to have a good spread for your application. So make sure you're ticking all the boxes, not just the ones that perhaps come a little bit easier to you. You know, push yourself out of your comfort zone a little as well um, and get support where you need to. That's, that's really good. And I think, um and I just comment if you're, if uh, the referees uh, do let the referee know that you're using them, yeah. might sound straight, <laughs> might, but occasionally, um, uh, if nothing else, uh, generally people like to be asked. Honestly, it's quite nice for someone to ask you, and you make sure you get their email, and then whoever you've applied to uh, sends an email to you and whatever. But it's it's if you just get one out of the blue and and the candidate never sort of let you know they were using you as a reference, then that's that happens, and. Uh, because people are busy and they move on and they mightn't be in your hospital anymore, they might be in a different hospital, they worked with you two years ago or whatever, and that can happen, And uh, but just do out of courtesy, uh, let people know. Uh, Jessica, you're, I would just on, on that, I would just emphasize to people on the CST, thinking about HST, and if you're at the start of your CST, you know, your application is Christmas of your second year, the interview is, is spring of your second year, so you do not have two years on the CST to score, you have about 18 months to score, so just from the very first day, you need to be going. There's no, oh, I'll ease in for a month or two and we'll, we'll get the logbook sorted out after Christmas or whatever, because before you know it, time, time is gone. Jessica, you're doing an MD, I think, at the moment, aren't you? Where do you think that fits into all of this kind of stuff? Um, so <clears throat> some of my colleagues had done a higher degree before they got onto core surgical training, but I wanted to 
do it sort of in the middle of my training. That's the decision that I made. And it, you don't have to pursue a higher degree, but it's something that I wanted. And the college were very supportive in letting me take two years out to do that. Um, and I've pursued my MD via the STAR MD program in RCSI, um, which is just a fantastic um, development for, for trainees to take two years out. And it's not specific to surgery either. Um, where does it fit in? I guess um, you get a higher degree out of it. You'll bolster your research portfolio, which stands to you for life. And that's why you should be starting to think about that now. And that is really an apprenticeship as well, learning how to perform audit and research. And that's something that, you know, your mentor or mentors would help you with. Um, I think it's really important, like people can get lost in the fog of all the points and everything like that. But you should be thinking about your career, say, 10 years from now as well. Very good. So, so what can a medical student do? The medical student um, would be great if they could make up their mind. But if they can't, that's okay too. We don't mind people taking time. Lots of people have taken uh, squiggly line journeys. Or something. Yeah, so they don't have to go in a straight line. Surgeons do tend to be clear, and most do, but not all do. Uh, I actually worry about the candidate who comes telling me they want to be a pediatric heart surgeon because I think, you've never seen it. You've never worked in it. Why do you want to do that really, really specific thing? And there's three jobs in this country, and there's not that many around the world. So it's very, very specific. So sometimes the medical student who's so narrow actually doesn't actually understand what it is they're trying to take on. So I don't. So I do like people to be clear and prepared and ambitious. Um, but it doesn't mean you can't change change your mind on the way. So the medical student really, for the audience, can really only influence their rank in the class in terms of scoring, if that's the way. And you can be internally happy that that's the decision you want to do in life. You want to take on surgery as your career, and you think it's going to, you're going to be good at it, and you're going to make you happy, and you might even do some good for some of your patients with a bit of luck, you know, which is the whole point of the whole thing. So that's all the medical students can do. The interns can think about doing their part. A, MRCS would be really fantastic if they had that done. And that's a pass-fail sort of issue from our point of view. There's no B, you want to watch your score, but A, you have to pass. Uh, it's great if you can do some extra projects. Uh, but for God's sake, finish them. Uh, there's nothing worse than someone coming to you saying, I'll do this and do this, and it just never happens. You're far better off doing one project every six months that finishes. And finish means you get an abstract somewhere, a presentation somewhere, or, or whatever. The CST interview, uh, Dara, this, most, of the marks are, most of the marks to get onto CST are actually that interview experience. Okay, there's 15 marks gone from the undergraduate thing, and there's 15 marks from the pre-score online, but an awful lot of it is the actual interview on the day itself. So uh, is there anything you'd say to the candidates to really kind of focus on as they turn up for that? Because we have some, some interns now who'll be doing that in two weeks. Yeah, we've, um, as you saw from the data, 70% of your scores from the interview um, and the four categories are there. I think certainly prepare well. Um, prior to COVID, it was all done face to face, but for lots of reasons, including the exponential rise in applicants from 100 to over 270 now, uh, we're running it all virtually. Um, I think prepare as well as possible. I think do a setup yourself beforehand, record yourself. It's always interesting to record yourself and watch yourself back and listen to what you're saying. I've done it myself for interviews. There's always a lot of am and mm and am additional things that you wouldn't suspect you do. So it's, it's well worth doing that beforehand. Obviously, be on time. Be it's, it's it's It amazes me sometimes when I'm on the interviews, people turn up uh, looking a bit casual. And it's such an important day in your, like it's, it's the opportunity to give the best performance to get the max of these 70 marks. So be prepared. Lots of preparation, I think. Within hospitals, I suppose, because I'm the chair of the CST program, I don't offer any preparation beforehand. I think that wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be a good option for me to do. So I, I, I think maybe go to some of your registrars who won't be interviewing and get practice runs off them. I suspect a lot of the consultants, over 110 of them around the country, are involved in the process. So they probably won't be in a position to give you a mock interview. But certainly prepare well um, and be on time, be ready. and. Uh, Best of luck to everybody doing it. That's it, exactly. Best of luck to everyone doing it. And we have we have some uh, CSTs here hoping to get onto the HST. So the message for them is like the clock starts day one. Your scoring is only in that window. Is that right, Kevin? So they, 
the, you have to be, you should have a little place where we were living with a desk and on the wall a picture of the scoring system and you should be going tick tick through, really focusing on the logbook which is a weighted score on it, really focusing on your MRCSB, nice to all the human factor courses that you're doing, you are scored on those, the practical tests that come automatically in, in, in all of that and then really preparing towards uh, really 18 months, uh, not two years because two years the interview's done and dusted. So we're just going to take a tiny little switching gear. Don't go anywhere, we're not finished. We're just going to have, um, uh, Catherine Jordan is from the affiliate office. She's going to just tell you how she can help you. And then we're going to throw it open to you guys. So you have a few seconds to think about whatever questions you want to tack us. And we'll take on and do our best to answer anything that, anything that comes. All right, hopefully it's the most helpful bit to you sometimes, the question and answer bit, okay? So you get a few minutes to think about things, about five, and then, and then we'll, we'll take on some questions. Thanks, Professor Healy, um, and a special thanks to our panellists. You've been very generous with your advice, um, and I'm sure you've given great benefit to the audience here today. So, um, as Professor Healy said, my name is Catherine Jordan, and I am the membership man manager in the Fellows and Members Office, uh, alongside my colleague Janelle Sherlock, um, who is the Engagement Marketing Executive, and Paul O'Reilly, our Finance Manager. And I would like to take this opportunity just to thank and acknowledge uh, the work that Janelle has put in in putting this program together today and a very strong panel. Um, we also collaborate very closely with our colleagues in surgical affairs uh, to support you on your pathway to surgery and to develop initiatives and benefits that are relevant uh, and helpful for you as you pursue your career in surgery. Um, you'll see our email address there and we'd be very happy to hear from you and talk to you today about affiliate membership and how we can support you. So by becoming a fellow member or affiliate member of RCSI, you gain many benefits, including becoming part of our worldwide membership network of over 11,000 members and fellows in 87 countries. RCSI membership is recognized around the world giving members a competitive advantage internationally through verification of your award and use of associated post-nominals. Members have access to e-journals and online resources, such as the Surgeon, Annals of Surgery, institutional repositories, and a wealth of information through our library services. We give our members career opportunities through fellowship, award and bursary opportunities, mentorship, specialty webinars, CPD opportunities and career development advice and so much more. And we also encourage our members to get involved to support a future generation of surgeons by contributing to publications, volunteering, mentoring and many other ways. Last year we brought all of our resources and supports together onto one Moodle portal for our affiliate members. We now offer a wide range of supports to help trainees prepare for MRC S exams and that's what we that is at the core of what we do is to help you to pass your MRCS exams and the core surgical training program and a future career in, in, in surgery. Later this year we'll launch a new online portal for fellows members and affiliate members giving you access to an even wider range of resources supports and benefits and we look forward to updating you on this uh, in the next weeks and months. And of course, we always like to hear from you uh, around what, what you need us to provide for you to help you pass your exams. If you're a medical student, an intern, junior or foundation doctor, NCHD or surgical trainee, and interested in pursuing a career in surgery, or you're already on a surgical training program and would like to join our membership community, please talk to us today you have a QR code there that will bring you directly to the application form or you can talk to us. And the Fellows and Members Office are committed to supporting you every step of the way, so we'd be delighted to help you become an affiliate member. We've left a bookmark in front of you that you'll see um, and again, we're available after this, after this talk to talk to you. So I will uh, hand you back to Professor Healy and our panellists and thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Uh, this uh, kind of thing wasn't uh, available to me when I was going through, uh, and I certainly think if I was going through now, I'd have been all over it. But uh, anyway, it sounds like a really good idea, and it's only starting. I'm sure it'll evolve and change. Only about a year old, is it? Or two years old, the affiliate membership? I think this is the second year now of it. So it's a relatively new thing, and I'm sure it'll evolve and change. 
So uh, this was uh, this session is about uh, how to become an outstanding surgeon, and uh, so which is kind of like how to become a surgeon. I think uh, they're all outstanding. Mm -hmm. So uh, any questions now? We've been talking for the last while, so now it's over to you. You've all gone to the bother registering, turning up and listening and taking the time. So what's going through your mind? Have we answered everything? Doubt it, have we? We'll start over here, but there's plenty of time for people if they want to get through. Yep, so do you want to uh, share your question with us? Uh, thank you so much for your time. And uh, just a quick question, as someone who is uh, currently doing a research project as part of his master's in surgery and preparing to sit the MRC as part A, how would you recommend uh, dedicating your time? Like, I eat, both of them require a good amount of effort to put in, so how would you recommend approaching those two so that you don't uh, achieve subpar results in either one of them? Yeah, can I just ask, are, are you an intern? Are you on the CST or are you a gap year? Or, or uh, gap year. You're a gap year. So you've done your intern and you're hopefully competing this year. Derek, yeah. do you want to take that one on or, or Kevin, do you want to? Yeah, certainly. Um, I think on that is a good opportunity maybe for me to qualify something I said earlier about research. I think research is extremely important, but it's the timing of it is the key thing. So as, as Jessica's doing in the, the out of program years in the middle of training, so at your stage, I think the key thing for you is the MRCS Part A. I think the other is important as well, but I would be advising you to do the MRCS Part A if you can and have that. Because I think if and when you get on the scheme, it's a, it's a narrow window. And if you get on the scheme and you've that 18 month window, if you were sick for the first diet of MRCS Part A, suddenly it's, it's, it's into January of, of the second six months of ST1 and the options are, are narrow. So not to create anxiety for you all, but I'd be prioritizing MRCS Part A and then research is important, but ideally later on in the program, particularly a, a master's. Thanks, Sarah. So I think you touched on the risk management issue there in some ways, that, there's, that to do the Part A, you can't sit Part B until you pass Part A. There are only so many sittings every year of Part A, three, isn't it? And there's only so, so many sittings of B. So uh, you can't apply for B to get A. So if you were sick or life's events happen, and they do happen, or and you miss one, then your time is back, and then you, let's say you didn't pass, and you had to repeat it. And now you cannot be shortlisted for a HSD interview without passing the Part B. So next thing you know, you've only maybe one shot, you're in your second year, you have to have it done by Christmas, you've probably got one shot, and if you don't get it, then you're, you know, and just imagine the pressure on yourself. So some of the, some of the advantage of getting it done earlier is it drops the pressure a bit. Having the A out of the way takes the pressure off you later on. Any other questions from the floor? Thanks very much for the talk. I was just wondering, is there any level of subjectivity in the interview process, or is it all just tick box um, exercises? Kevin, we'll let, we'll let you leave that. Very good question. Um, well, the largest component of the marks is the 25%, um, as outlined on the slide earlier on. The, the, I suppose the, the largest component of the marks go for what's called the overall suitability uh, category, which is there, I guess, to allow for um, your performance on the day of the interview uh, to impress the interviewers. Um, insofar as the centile score is concerned, that's, that's at a certain level. The psychometric testing is done, and that's all locked in before you sit the interview. Um, the questions around the clinical scenarios, uh, very straightforward. You either get them or you don't. Uh, then you've got the research and audit and teaching uh, module. And then you've got the issues around communication, teamwork, negotiation, MDT meetings, all of that. But the biggest percentage of the marks is for overall suitability in a career in surgery. So that's where we ask you why you want to be a surgeon. Uh, what strengths do you have? What do you think uh, marks you out as a suitable uh, applicant for a surgical career. Uh, so in terms of preparation for the interview, getting back to what Dara was saying, uh, preparing for the interview, I think, you know, teasing it out in your own mind as to why you want to be a surgeon and what are the attributes that you have uh, that would make you a, a good surgeon. Uh, so they would include things like being organized and being prepared, having good communication skills, good presentation skills, uh, being a good teacher. Um, and generally, um, having resilience as well, I believe, is very important. Uh, being a surgeon in this era 
is challenging um, for all sorts of reasons. Uh, you also have to sort of look at the future of surgery and the future of surgical practice. So in terms of preparing for the interview, those 25% of the marks gives uh, an opportunity for you to, um, you know, introduce an element of your own, uh, your own preparation and why you believe you have the skill set to be a surgeon. And bear in mind as well, the future of surgery, uh, which is the theme of the Charter Day meetings this year, incorporates a significant amount of uh, sessions here about uh, future technology and future innovations in surgery and how that will impact on future surgical practice. Uh, and also bear in mind as well that the future of surgery will involve surgeons working uh, more and more together. Uh, the old model of the surgeon being at the top of the tree and having a number of trainees uh, is probably uh, not going to persist for more than another couple of years. I think surgeons in the future will work in teams and there will be a lot more teamwork at a senior level, which I think is the, is the best way forward. So preparing for the interview, um, you know, these are things that you could also bring to the table in terms of the type of questions you might be asked and the answers you could give uh, as part of your preparation. I would, I would, um, I would just pull it back to uh, one tiny bit. I mean, this is all about you, and that's the purpose of today. But the purpose of the process is to make sure that there are surgeons let loose in the world who are competent and able to do the job safely for the patients. That's really what it's about. The kind of conversation we have here is a bit different, isn't it? It's about how you get there. But, but from the process point of view, we're trying to make sure that at the end of it all, you're safe, you're competent to let loose in the world. All right. So there's kind of been three phases in my, in my observation of how people were assessed with this. The original way was the apprentice model, very much a personal relationship. Uh, the consultant who you worked for said, this is a good person, they'll be a good surgeon. And you had an interview with 20 people and the professor said, this is a good person, we should take them. And that was how it went. And by and large it worked. I mean, no one was reckless. They only wanted good people to go through. But Obviously, it's vulnerable, it's open to, you know, they, made, they brought me coffee, they didn't bring me coffee, do you know what I mean? Or I didn't like them, or they supported Man U, and I support Liverpool. Or, you know, it's, this kind of, it's open to that kind of stuff. So things evolved. So the, the selection process in the College of Surgeons became much more scientific. So they had to do a process of marking and scoring and trying to make it a bit more objective and to get away from that old personal, I like that person, I don't like that person kind of thing. So. That's where all the emphasis on scoring and marks have come from in my time that I've lived through this. In the beginning, it was really easy to give people marks for research because they had a degree, they didn't have a degree, they had a paper, they didn't have a degree. So how do you score someone who can do an appendix? Or how do you score someone who can do a hernia? So at the beginning, that was quite hard. So you saw in the first phase of all of this, a huge reward for people who were doing research, MDs, PhDs. When I was going through, you wouldn't really get an interview unless you had an MD. Like, that was the way it was. And then the criticism became that people were so focused on the research that they were forgetting how to operate and that we weren't producing surgeons. So now the sort of third phase we're in now, and it's evolving, I'm not, it's definitely not the finish, is but the switch back in the, to, to keep the objective scoring, but to push it back to how you measure a surgeon, which is why we do some of the workshops, why you get scored in the OSCEs, why the, the emphasis on the logbook, why the emphasis on the MRCS exam, so that the core bits that you can look after the patient with are looked after and scored. And obviously, scoring that objectively is something that, that's a work in progress. We're doing our, we're doing our best, we're, we're trying more. But if you're into this kind of stuff, and uh, there's a great book called Noise, if you want to read it about all this, this kind of stuff, and it it's, comes into, this kind of thinking comes into the way the interview is done. We're doing our best to do it in a nice, objective fashion and to try and get out that personality stuff. So for example, when you're doing the interview, you don't know what the person's scores are for any of these other elements. So you're blind to that. And you don't know what are the, the other examiners are scoring. So it's all independent marking. So that kind of gets away some of that group kind of, kind of stuff. But there is an element of trying to subjectively judge how a person's going to behave. And that's, that's hard to predict. But frankly, and honestly, in surgery, you can teach anyone to stitch something. All right? And all the stuff is done by mere mortals. All the stuff about surgeons being super duper, heart surgeons, whatever. It's all done by mere mortals. But the successful or the good or the effective surgeon is often more the behavior than the stitch. 
and being cool under pressure and how people interact with people. So we do have to look at that and explore that side of the business. That's sort of an evolving side of the assessment process. I'd say in 10 years' time, we'll be assessing it different again. But at the moment, that's why all those questions are there, because frankly, when people run into trouble in the real world, it's very rarely that they didn't stitch the blood vessel together. It's usually that they were fighting with someone, or they didn't get on, or their behavior of the patient was wrong. Do you know, that's, that's usually where it is. So we're working on how you score all that. So we're kind of in third round of that. And uh, I'd say there'll be a fourth and a fifth round in due course, but that's kind of where things are at at the moment. Do we have any other questions from, from here? And any other questions as well after that, we'll happily take. Thank you for the talk. Um, I, I do have a question about the surgical logbook. There is a lot of emphasis on that and having a certain amount of procedures that you log in your logbook. But I have two questions. First of all, how can you maximize the amount of benefit that you get from the procedures that you've logged in your logbook? Like you can attend, but not have much, uh, how do you say this, much uh, input in the surgery and you can have a big logbook list. And uh, second of all, uh, is, there a, is there consideration for your input in the surgery, like a subjective element, someone who took a big part in the surgery versus someone who has a, a big uh, logbook list but has less role in the surgery? So that's a superb question for those who, who are only learning this, because obviously we're talking about how much weight you put on the logbook in terms of your measurement of your performance. So this is a superb question. It becomes a really core thing. Jessica, just because you've recently done it more than us, you might give a very brief answer in terms of your experience of it, and then the scoring, we might move on to, to Dara and Kevin if you want, but I don't mean to be putting you under pressure there, sorry, but about, about gaming the logbook would be one, one way of looking at it. But, but I know what you're saying, that there can be different rotations, which is one element. There can be different numbers on the team between you and the front. There could be a pile of other people on the team or a small team or a big team. And um, can you tell us, uh, Jessica, about the scoring of all that? Yeah, so there's, uh, there's a lot that goes into, say, maxing out your logbook, so getting to the top number of points and doing that, you know, truthfully and genuinely um, while still taking part in the larger operations and getting exposure to them. And for those, you don't get as many points, but they're still important. So in terms of ma maxing, are you asking maybe about how do you get the most number of points if you don't have access to... I think she's asking how do you overcome difficulties. If you find yourself in a scenario that you're not getting okay. to the front, I think, okay. kind of, uh, is as how do you... Any advice as a trainee, and we might uh, get advice from the seniors about how, as a trainee, if you feel you're not getting to the front of the queue in the operating list, what can you do to try and get yourself there? So... Um, it starts... Like, it starts with the basics, so it starts, obviously, at work in the hospital and, uh, you know, working hard putting your patient first and being a good team player, having good work ethic and being humble. And those, th those are the things that your trainers will notice. And they're more likely to help you and support you and give you cases and advice. But in terms of pure access to cases, like volunteer yourself for everything, like providing you're working within, you know, your working hours and you're not burning yourself out, like go to extra scope lists, assist the, the endoscopist with the, with the procedure, um, you know, if there's two trainees and there's one minor ops list, assist each other. You know, you're working in a team then as well and you both get points for the same procedure and you're also learning. Um, so there's loads of opportunities in the hospital to get more points. If you know that one of the, you know, orthopedic uh, SHOs is away for a week and you have a quiet day, go and ask them if you can have their injection list, their joint injection list. Um, or, you know, some, some of the vascular teams will do Botox injections and things like that. So th there's lots of opportunities like that. You just have to keep your eyes and ears open and be available to people. And then they'll start offering you things because they know that you're helpful. Yeah, uh, thanks. Can, can I just clarify, are you, what stage are you at yourself? Are you in... Right, okay. So I suppose for some of the audience, maybe you won't know exactly what the logbook is. It's a, it's a record of operations uh, as you go through the, the training program. In the, uh, Professor Trainer, Professor Sean Tierney and Dunnick Ryan have developed this over the last number of years, and it's a, it's a wonderful resource. Initially, your point is well made. For example, if, if I had have been Professor Trainer's SHO, the National Liver Transplant Unit, I clearly wouldn't have been doing liver transplants as a, as a first-year SHO. Um, 
but I probably would have done components of them. So I think on the back of your point and, and, and other points similarly made, we developed a complexity score, which is that for those bigger operations, you would get a score for not doing it because you shouldn't be doing it, but you're partaking in and learning that way. And then for say minor procedures that you'd be doing a lot more of those. So it's a complexity score. You, so it's, it's, it's a composite score based on your participation in bigger operations and then performing the smaller ones. So, so that's how you get to that logbook score. What we are seeing more and more recent years is people are, I suppose, working extremely hard during the six month period, such that th the mean is pretty much close to the top level and we are seeing people are maxing out on their logbooks. Um, and I think all the points Jessica has made are, are, are very well made in terms of getting access to those operations. Yeah, and I would add to what Dara said as well. I mean, on a practical level, um, you know, uh, your consultant or your consultant trainer has a responsibility to you. Um, so I usually sit down with my team and look at whatever the list is and sort of decide in advance um, what operations uh, we're going to do and where the trainees may get to do part of or a whole of an operation. So there are classic operations like inguinal hernia repair, laparoscopic appendisectomy, uh, and from there, um, various other types of procedures where we could delegate a particular operation where I take the trainee through that particular operation um, so that at least what we try to do is to keep everybody happy and everybody on board. Now, the work has to get done safely and the consultant is ultimately responsible uh, for all aspects of the patient journey. Uh, but I think it's a matter of uh, agreeing in advance um, about uh, the uh, level of um, exposure to the operation that each trainee is going to get under supervision. So I think it's a question of communicating with your consultant trainer and just pointing out you know, your, your goals and your aspirations around, around your clinical post and getting an agreement as to, and we call that in surgical terminology, we call that the learning agreement, uh, it's as simple as that, which every surgical trainee has uh, with their consultant trainer at the start of the uh, six month rotation. And in, in most uh, higher surgical training programs, we have what's called a midpoint review, uh, where we sit down after three months to see, well, how do you think things are going? Are you happy with the training that you're receiving? Uh, can we discuss your logbook, uh, see can we, can we do things even better? So I think it's all about communication. And uh, as Dara said, we can break operations down into steps as well. So for example, we can take a laparoscopic cholecystectomy and break that down into 10 steps. So you might get to put in some of the laparoscopic ports at the start of the procedure. You might get to mobilize part of the gallbladder. When it comes to dissecting out the structures of callus of triangle, the, common, uh, the cystic duct and the cystic artery, you may or may not be at the level of ability where you can do that, but you may have done parts of the operation at the start. And that's, uh, that's how we go, and that's how we build up experience. So every operation is, is a learning opportunity. So I think it's a question of organization and coordination and agreement uh, with, with your consultant and, and often with your registrar as well. Yeah, I agree with that. So in, in the hearts, uh, a bypass operation, a uh, uh, first year SHO isn't expected to do that, but there's a strenotomy, there's a leg harvest, there's an internal mammary harvest, there's cannulation to the bypass machine, there's a top end of a bypass graft, there's a bop at bottom end of a bypass graft, there's disconnection from the bypass machine, there's drying, closing, and all. there's loads of steps and they all kind of get separated out in your interest so that you can show that you're doing something and that's how you do even before logbooks in the current scoring era like that's what you did you didn't go in day one and do the whole operation you you did a bit and worked your way through it can be maybe a bit frustrating for some people but there you go i would just say that uh, uh to kind of uh, f uh, say my own experience on on this uh, you absolutely you sit down and learn an agreement beforehand and you try and understand where the person is and you try and match it with what would be useful for them um, but I would just remind people that, um, uh, as, I, as I said, this is very much a conversation about you, if you don't want, you'd like, but, yeah, as a trainee, and that is true. But for me as a consultant, you know, there is a service here as well. So I love ambitious surgical trainees. Um, when people do MDs, the labs love them because they work so hard. They're ambitious. They get things done. They close things out, and it's marvelous. But if you have a trainee whose only interest is the logbook, that's not as interesting for me. 
So if I'm um, giving people cases or bits of cases, uh, it is expected that they look after the patient and that the next day they know something about them. And if I come around and they don't know there's been a problem or they don't know how they've done and they want to do cases, that's a bit of a disconnect uh, that I'd really emphasize to you. Every day is a job interview. So when you turn up, you're impressing your consultants even on non-operating days so that on the operating days, they think this person is working hard, they're doing a good job, they're looking after the patients. It's a two-way deal. Okay. Uh, any other questions out there from the back? Yeah. Okay. Thanks again for the talk. Um, when it comes to the selection process, Prof. Barry has mentioned that um, 17 out of the 81 successful applicants were non-European. Now, considering that the majority or there's a high percentage of the doctors that are working in, in Irish hospitals are non-European, is this going to change at some point in the future because this does affect the planning of whether you want to stay in the country or leave the country? Thank you. Uh, yes, um, I guess, you know, my answer to that is that we, we operate within a legislative framework. Um, we uh, interview uh, all of the uh, applicants um, across four days and we score them and we rank them in order of merit, uh, which means we rank them from the person who has come first down to the person who has come at the very end of the competition and we select the top 80 candidates. Uh, from 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 that list in order of merit, uh, non-EU candidates um, qualify on the basis of um, various criteria set out by the HSE and the Department of Health and the Department of Foreign Affairs. So we use the existing criteria, including the uh, Stamp Four legislation, which allows people of non-EU um, citizenship uh, to receive the same entitlements as an EU citizen, provided that they've worked in this country, I believe, for a two-year period. So uh, our, our uh, approach to this is to appoint um, the best people for surgical training. And what we're trying to do in this case is to provide a level playing field to as many people as possible. Uh, so last year, 2022, was um, a year where um, that 17 uh, out of 81 uh, would be the highest number of non-EU people appointed to core surgical training to date. And that's probably a trend that will continue over time. So in terms of equality and diversity, which I think is part of, part of your question, um, I think that's the direction we're definitely moving in. Uh, and so it's purely uh, designed uh, to give the best candidates the opportunity to progress. Uh, so I guess going forward, um, it'll be a mixture of both EU and non-EU citizens, um, but we apply the legislative framework, and in doing so, we're fair to everybody. And uh, we will have, um, if you like, um, the same competition rules this year and the same legislative framework, uh, so we will appoint people as far as we're concerned, on the basis of merit. Um, so the emphasis is on merit rather than on citizenship or ethnic background. And I think that's very important for the future of surgery in this country and for the future of our society, because the surgical workforce should reflect the composition of society in terms of gender and ethnic background and, and everything else. Uh, so that's the way forward uh, into the future. And, and so from that point of view, I think we've got good structures in place uh, to promote uh, equality and diversity in terms of the selection of candidates. And that also applies in higher surgical training as well. I think uh, there's probably time for maybe one more question um, at the back. I'll maybe take a second very quick one. We'll do those two, and that's probably us done. I'll start, start off the back yeah, when you, once you have your microphone. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the talk. Um, yeah, just, I was thinking about the non-EU thing as well, because non-EUs, there's a, there's a, it's not, there's also British citizens and there's also people with stamp four. Uh, we know that they are, there's a different ranking, um, at least from the RCSI website. Um, but I was going to ask about something else, um, which is, so it's reassuring that there's 40% of people who have done the MRCS Part A. Um, I was wondering, so if you've done the MRCS Part A, are you more likely to get on? So 
if we know 40% of successful applicants have the MRCS Part A, but um, what is the converse? Does that make sense? That's a, yeah, that's a perfect question. So uh, do all the Part A's get on? And if you, uh, do some of the Part A's not get on to CST? And uh, you're kind of asking, do you have to have the Part A to get on to CST in a, in, in, in a way of asking, yeah. So um, if, for the people who don't have Part A, the MRCS, uh, how do they fare when they apply? Are they left behind, is kind of the question. Uh, no, no. Uh, the answer to that is, is it's not essential to have it. <clears throat> it's just advice based on the timelines, based on that 18-month window. And if you miss the first diet, you're suddenly up to January if you fail it once. And, and, the, and the, the, the failure or non-success rate is pretty high in this exam. It's a difficult exam. So you can succeed without having the MRCS. We're just advising that there's other pressures during that 18-month window. So if you can get it done, it's preferable, desirable, but doesn't influence progression on today. Yeah, and I agree, I agree with Dara. Like if you, if, if you, if you look at it another way, um, passing part A is just giving you a time advantage and it's taking a certain amount of pressure off you. But there are plenty of people appointed to core surgical training who haven't passed part A getting on to the uh, core surgical training program. But it's a question of timing, and I guess uh, it, gives you a, it gives you a good head start. It gives you better time to prepare for Part B. Now, Dara did allude to another point there, which is that the Part A exam is, well, it's a multiple choice exam, and it's a, it's a, it's a competitive exam. And um, you have to achieve uh, something in the region of 71 or 72 percent of correct answers to pass that exam. It's an intercollegiate exam. So what that means is that all surgical trainees in Ireland and in the other royal colleges across the UK are all sitting the same exam at the same time. So the pass mark is high. The pass mark is in the region of 71%. So it's not an easy exam. It's an exam, as Jessica mentioned, can take maybe three months, I think you said, Jessica, to prepare for that exam. So it's an exam that needs a lot of preparation, uh, and hence the emphasis on, on, on passing that exam. But it's not meant to be an obstacle to apply for core surgical training. You can apply for core surgical training as often as you like. Uh, so in other words, if you apply for core surgical training and you're unsuccessful this year, for example, you can apply again next year and the year after that if you wish. So there's no limit to the number of times that you can apply for core surgical training. Um, but our emphasis on passing Part A or suggesting passing Part A is just purely to give you a head start. In my own, in my own career, uh, when I qualified for medical school in 1986, after my internship, I did the very same as Jessica. I did a standalone clinical year during which I passed uh, the old uh, primary or equivalent of Part A exam. So when I got on to uh, the surgical training program at, at, at a very junior level as, a, as an SHO, I already had part A of the exam out of the way, and that allowed me to hit the ground running, so to speak, and, and the rest is history. And look at him now. <laughs> so, to thank you very much. Yeah, exactly. Four, 48 um, out of the 80, you know, didn't have the part A. So, you, it, it can, it don't feel you, if you don't have it, you can't get there. So, one quick question from over here, and then we'll, unfortunately, we're, we're closing it then. We're happy to speak to anyone thank afterwards. You. All the panel are very approachable. They don't bite, so they'll happily talk to anyone. Your last uh, question, sir. Thank thanks. You. Yeah. Uh, I also have a question about Part A. So just from a timing point of view, there's three sittings of the exam, I think January, May, and September. Um, if someone were to sit and pass the exam in the January sitting, is that too late in the game for getting onto the CSC in that same year, if that makes sense? I, I guess, how quickly did the results come out, and are they taken into so account? the application is in, and you pass between the application and the interview, is, it, is, it, is, it, is what you're saying? Yeah, exactly, yeah. Well, I mean, the closing date for applications is, like, was, was the 17th of November, 2022. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that was all locked in, and we've already selected people, and uh, they will be called to interview. Um, but um, we're not scoring, uh, whether you have part A of the exam or not, we're not giving you any marks for having passed our Part A. So if you did sit Part A in January of this year, and you happen to, and I hope you passed the, the exam, it's not going to make any difference to um, 
the marks that we're going to allocate to you during the, um, the core surgical training interviews. Um, so I hope, am I answering the question properly for you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. I'd say you'd be entitled to sneak it in there and answer to some of your questions, you know, why you want to do surgery. I'm really interested. I did the exam the other day in the past. Uh, so I'm going to say uh, thank you very much to everyone here uh, today. I've enjoyed it at my end. I hope you have it yours. And uh, should we love talking about surgery, talk about surgery all day. And uh, that, I think, is going to be the same for all the panel. And the, all of uh, the panel will be happy to chat to you uh, and guide you afterwards. I want to say a special thanks to Janelle Sherlock, who's uh, done all the work and put in all this together. Um, she's from the affiliate office and uh, really did a huge amount of work to put this together. Um, there is lunch upstairs in the exam room between one and two, uh, if you'd like to go up and uh, we'll happily uh, talk to anyone. And then you have emails and stuff for the affiliate office and for the dean's office in the college if there's any further questions. So enjoy the rest of the charter day.